Monday the 18th of November, unusually for me, I took a day off work. Instead of broadcasting to the demolition world, precisely as I've done for the last four and a half years, I took a trip into London to meet up with an old friend, Patrick Williamson. Those in the UK will know that Patrick held the position of Convention Chairman at the National Federation of Demolition Contractors for a number of years. He took the Federation's big annual event to far-flung destinations including Barcelona, Killarney, Madeira, Mallorca and even Monte Carlo. During an association with the Federation that endured for more than 40 years, Patrick rubbed shoulders with the great and the good of the UK demolition industry. And as a stickler for protocol, he single-handedly ensured that the Federation's proud traditions were retained. Now, during my day off, Patrick and I took a tour of Big Ben, parts of the Palace of Westminster. We had lunch together, and we had a few drinks together as well, but mostly we talked. We talked about old times and old friends and old adversaries. I recorded almost an hour of that chat, but for the sake of expediency, I've whittled it down to this 16-minute video. I'll probably hold the remainder of our chat in reserve. You never know when it might come in handy. So for now, here is Patrick Williamson recounting his time with a once great federation. Let's go back to 2009. I arrived at a hotel in Kalani for the National Federation of Demolition Contractors convention, where you were convention chairman. And I always say the same thing whenever I arrive and speak to anyone. How are you doing? And your response was, I nearly died. What the hell happened? It's a... Uh... It's an interesting story. I decided to have a, a few days with my wife before the convention started. Uh, David Darcy was the president, cracking bloke, and uh, took my car over and I had like paraphernalia that was needed for the weekend and everything else. So I went up to Ackle Island and in a, a sort of tragic sea accident, nearly took my life. I got washed out to sea and uh, rescued by the Irish Coast Guard. My me, me phone went down with it, so it had to get replaced. David Darcy was ringing me, thinking, where is he? And I spent five days in intensive care, only being released like 48 hours before the event. And I managed to get down there, and it, it made all the papers in Ireland, but it took me a bit of time to recover from that. That's why ever since then, I'm, my number one thing is always to keep us fit and as healthy as we can. You know? You also did some work immediately after that, raising money for the, the lifeguard or the uh, Coast Guard? Yeah, the, the Irish Coast Guard. It was the Coast Guard helicopter that lifted me out of the sea and literally flew me straight to hospital. That's what saved me, saved my life, the, the, the dedication of the team. But it was the Irish Coast Guard in Ackle that could see me in the water. They'd sent a dinghy out, and believe it or not, which is the Coast Guard and the RLA are separate, but they work in unison, and it's the Coast Guard that will call the RLA out. And there was two RLA boats on its way out to it, plus the Coast Guard dinghy. But the helicopter came down from Sligo to County Mayo, off Ackle Islands in Mayo. So it's off the coast. It's the most westerly point in Ireland. And it spotted me in the water and lifted me. But that was all thanks to the Irish Coast Guard spotter that was on a quad bike, believe it or not, going along the coast looking for me. And he could see me in the water half a mile off the coast with these unbelievable binoculars that he had. What I'd done... I found that the Coast Guard station wasn't open and it wasn't open due to legalities uh, to do with the Irish government, courts and this, that and the other. And the Coast Guard were operating under a very old, what looked like a, a concrete bunker, like an air raid shelter. And I thought, this isn't right. I used the legislation that they had given to a NFDC contractor to do some work in Dublin what they expected the contract to provide by way of uh, site hygiene, this, that, the toilets, all the rest, to say, why are you doing it for your own Coast Guard? And that was the bit that flicked them over. I actually went and seen Enda Kenny, who was the leader of the opposition, but then became Prime Minister of Fishock in Ireland, and it was him that forced it all the way home. The greatest day was when I actually got invited. I got invited to the opening as, as one of the guests of honour set in the front row. But with all the great and the good, that was, that was good. And another man that helped us was a man that uh, has come to the Federation, Senator Paul Cochran of Killarney, who has since passed away. He died shortly before the last convention in, in Ireland. And uh, he was very helpful in opening the doors to get it open. I also nominated him for the Irish Courage Awards, which they won as well. And I got invited to Devlin for the presentation of that. So 
Yeah, obviously, all of, all of that happened while you were convention chairman, and, yeah. and you, it's a position you, you held with, with some aplomb for quite some time. But your history with the NFTC goes way back further than, than just a convention chairman role, isn't it? I was told by the legendary Sidney Hunt, which some of your viewers will know, that I was the youngest bloke ever to join the Federation after my father passed away. And that was in 1980, which was 44 years ago. I'm showing my age there a bit there now. And I've had a sort of unbroken period with the Federation, bar a, a few months since that time. I've been regional chairman. I've been vice president, second vice president. I was convention chairman for 15 years. That's a bit of a title. I followed Thord Brown. I've enjoyed all the times with him and had some, met some lovely and memorable people. Sorry, some of them are not long, longer with us, but I have fond memories of them all. And that's where we are today. As somebody that's held the position of regional chairman and vice president and stuff, that puts you in line for the top job, does it not? I actually put myself forward when Simon Barlow went down. I spoke to Duncan Rodell about it. Duncan seemed a bit confused because he said, you're not eligible to stand because you're only vice chairman of the Midlands and Welsh region. So I was obviously going round again for the second time. I pointed out that I've been chairman of the Midlands and Welsh region. I have been council rep of the Middles and Welsh region. I have been second vice president and vice president. The, the last two positions are held for a total of five years. The only reason I didn't take on the president's job, at that time it was very onerous. I had a old family and I was still building my business. And the time it would have taken to dedicate to that, obviously the circumstances have changed now. I'm a director of coordinate and I would have been able to take that role on. They've obviously changed the rules, which prohibits me from joining. I'm retirement age. I notice that other people are older than me in the Federation, but for some unknown reason, you've got to be on PAYE. I no longer pay national insurance contribution because I am retirement age. I've paid the maximum. I've been precluded. So, so that, that's, that's what they've done. They've moved me up, you know. The rules of succession seem to have been queered a bit anyway, because what was it, four years ago, Gary Bishop was next in line. He was vice president. And he was leapfrogged by incumbent President John Lynch. And it now seems like he, he held that position anyway, but he looks like he's going to be leapfrogged again. Adrian Corrigan. It, I don't know what, what, what Adrian's doing. Adrian has been put forward. I thought people had to put themselves forward and it was up to the members to vote on him. But whether that, I haven't been to a number of meetings for the past nine months, so I don't know what rule changes they brought in. Nobody sends me anything anymore. So I don't know. Certainly, when I was at the IDE meeting with the AGM last week, he was introduced as Adrian Corrigan, incoming president of the NFTC. So well, it sounds like a fate of complete to me. That's what, probably what it is. I can't be put forward because they've changed the rules. And you've got to be, apparently, you've got to be on PAYE with the for a backdated for two years. I'd be interested in knowing who put that forward, but that's entirely up to them. If that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. You and I have got a slightly, I don't know if it's unique, but we've certainly got something unusual in common in that you and I have both been ousted by the NFTC, not once, but twice. Now, I understand why I was ousted. I was considered to be too outspoken. And when I was given the heave over the first time, I'd been very outspoken about site fatalities, and they used that as an excuse. They then brought me back to help promote the Demo Expo, and then I was let go again. You served as convention chairman, faultlessly, including conventions in places like Monte Carlo, for example. You were then let go. I think they realised the error of their ways. You were brought back and then they go again. It makes no sense. William Crooks asked me to come back. And obviously William was, is the chairman of the company that I'm a director of. Because it was COVID had been on, everything had slowed right down. And he felt with his wife that he'd like to have an event and to help the staff put it together. And that's what I did do. I thought outside the box. I had to get two COVID injections to get to and four flights to get out to Monaco at that time of the year, and I managed to book everything. I also think the, the icing on the cake was the Yacht Club de Monte Carlo. You'll never get it again for a function. We managed to get that. I made representation to the head of state there in order to get it. We were granted it with our connections with Winston Churchill and his late father. And also the entertainer at the time, Rebecca Burr, was singing only a week ago at the, in London for the King for the Princess Anne and everything else on Remembrance Night on the Saturday night at the Royal Albert Hall. We had world-class entertainment. And I still think the two conventions 
to Monte Carlo were the best two we ever had. There was no doubt about it. But we just hit it at the right time. Uh, Monte Carlo was opening up again after COVID, and we just hit the deal at the, at the right time. I had a good agent that we could negotiate a deal, and we filled, we filled it to capacity. You've mentioned 44 years, which is one hell of a service. Obviously, your, your ground is started with the likes of Sid Hunt and Claude Brown, who are basically legends of the NFTC, legends of the industry. But over the course of 44 years, you've worked with lots and lots of presidents. Who, who were the high points? So personally, I'd, I'd certainly put David Darcy among those. I served as convention chairman for Gaddy Bishop, John Ring, David Clark, uh, Ross Turner, who is no longer with us, Dan Doyle. I haven't missed anybody out there. John Lynch, what once you could say, uh, uh, and others. But S Sydney, I think Sydney recognised that he, although it, I wasn't in the position to do the president's job, I stepped back and allowed somebody else to do it. Within three months, I was getting a phone call. Got to help Claude. Claude was. His health was starting to fail a bit. Um, we, went out, we went out to Killarney and booked it, and we, and we got Claude to go out on a hunt. It was really a really fantastic event. And then after that, I, th I thought we need to bring... I like to have things a freak new. There's lots of places you can go to. There's lots of events you can do, not just the same old. So that's why I went to Finland, Austria, Sweden, Monte Carlo... Adira, that's just an MFU place. So I, I pushed it out and I could get the members to go. The Federation feels like it's changed to me. I'm quite outspoken about how it has changed and not necessarily for the better. It does seem to have gone, in my opinion at least, it's gone from being the leader, forging ahead, to being a follower, jumping on the mental health bandwagon, jumping on the women in construction bandwagon. Do you get that feeling or are you still a firm believer? I, I'm involved quite heavily with South and City College in Birmingham, who would like to work with the Federation. However, it's never happened, do you know what I mean? Yet it's the biggest single college in the West Midlands with 26,000 students, young people in work, a lot of them in the construction game. A lot of the people working on HS2 that have got into it have gone through that college. And we should be advancing there. I feel it all seems to be London orientated at the moment. There's no more social events. The last social event, the Millers of Welsh, and they've had a, a golf day, and I highly commend them that it's all for charity. And they, but you get some people turn around and say to you, "Oh, the, people don't want events anymore." But I'd like to, I'd like to see who they're talking to. If you put on an event, people will go. Yeah, I was mean, certainly speaking on the Monday after the AGM of the IDE last week. It was busy, and nobody wanted to go home. It was lots and lots of um, catching up. You know? Young Mr. McLean will do a first-class job there and I'm very well. He's a good bloke. I know his father. He sadly lost his uncle there just about a month ago, Chris McLean. But a tremendous family. And the bloke is driven. And you've got to have people that are driven and want to give the time and make the energy. When I say we haven't had a, an event in the Midlands, that Scotland, Northern Ireland, North East, North Ireland, there doesn't seem to be anything happening other than something London oriented. And I think it should move around. I think it should move around the country a bit, but that's up to them. Just going back to the, the history of the NFDC, your 44 years. Yeah. I obviously don't go back as far as that, but it never seemed to be the idea that people were ousted. And yet of late, I was, I was an outside contractor, so no big deal, but I was ousted. Paul Brown was ousted. You were ousted, and most recently, of course, Howard Bond was ousted. Regardless of the circumstances, that never used to be the way, did it? It wasn't the way. In the, in the early days, the Federation had nothing but its membership. It had no offices. We used the offices both in London and in the Midlands of the Federation of Civil Engineers. They went out of business. I, I remember Danny Doyle, who was chairman of the Midlands of Welsh, and myself and a couple of others, we had to go and recover our paperwork before the receivers took it from the building it was in. It was in, Sydney was the driving force that we needed our own office building. And we, we bought our very first one and it's gone on from there. We had our own offices in our own place at our own base. My greatest memory is when they bought the first office building to make the final payment. The bank manager was a bloke called Paul Costello from the Bank of Ireland. I helped to restructure the finance of it at the time to bring the mortgage down. And I was one of the signatures on the final check to pay the mortgage off that building. 
So that gave us a base and it's, it's moved on. We, the Federation has recently sold two properties. The property they got now is fantastic. So they've got the training in one side and they think the, the, the main office is the other, uh, with expansion and room to grow. But there's new people coming in all the time. I just hope they look after it the same as we did. Your proudest and cheap within the NFTC. What would that be? Colo not Colony, Monte Carlo, perhaps? I think the, the very first trip to Monte Carlo, I remember John Ring's face when he says to me, because he was basically left up to be defined somewhere. He goes, what do you think we should do? And I said, we're, we're going to go to Monte Carlo. And he, he was like, can we afford it? But we made it work. And it was tremendous. I think the two Monte Carlo trips, both of them were great. We had Joe Longthorne, was the legendary singer, was at the first one. Absolutely legend, star, and fantastic bloke. And I say Rebecca Burke at the second one. Now we've seen how far she's gone singing for the king. And she sang for us first. And that's my dream. But the other thing is I've, I've been involved over the years with others, not just me, with the charities. And we've given a lot of money to lots of different charities that have made a difference. People forget that the Federation bought 25 minibuses long time ago, when these were all for charities that couldn't get a minibus, that were rejected, that nobody had given us anything, but we did. And the first two minibuses were LDVs, and they were set up in Centenary Square in Birmingham. Everybody from London, the London bus was there, the Birmingham bus was there for the Handicapped Children's Pilgrimage Trust in Birmingham. It was all set up with bagpipers and a lunch and everything else. And it was all done in Birmingham. And that was... Another good achievement. Uh, today, things have changed, but the Federation makes a name for it. It helps support lots of charities and you can't take it away from them. But I think we need to train the next generation. We need, that's what we should be looking at. That's where the energy should be thrown in at, not just in London, but in Birmingham, around the country. That's the future, is bringing people in. The government wants to build. There's an article in the Times newspaper this morning, I brought it with me, saying that the chances are that Labour will actually build less houses than the Conservatives. And it lists all the reason why. There's nobody to do them. They haven't got the workforce to do to build these one and a half million houses. They'd be lucky if they build half a million houses, is what I've said. These sites are going to be cleared. Yes, demolition firms are busy, but how big do you grow? You'd, you need the next generation coming in. And the machinery and the equipment today and the stuff that you've got to deal with it, you need to have some sort of proper education status going through. And it needs to be all over the country. That's the future.